And welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. And right now we are joined by none other than presidential candidate Gary Johnson. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much for being David, here. David, great to be on with you. Thank you. Now, uh, Governor, um, we obviously know who you are here at InfoWars. Uh, the Freedom Movement knows who you are. But several polls show that a majority of Americans do not know who you are. So for those who are listening right now, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, some of your political accomplishments. Well, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Uh, I started a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque in 1974 and actually grew that to employ over 1,000 people over a 20-year period. I became Intel's facilities contractor before the 286 chip. Uh, I sold that business in 1999. Nobody lost their job. They're doing better than ever, and it allows me to have a full-time unpaid job running for president of the United States. Uh, I had never been involved in politics prior to running for governor of New Mexico, so ran completely outside the political system as a Republican in a state that's two to one Democrat, got elected governor in a state that's two to one Democrat, and I'd like to think it was based on what I had to say, which was really common sense business approach to state government, best product, best service, lowest price, uh, let's just have some common sense, uh, less government is better government. Uh, I made a name for myself being governor for perhaps vetoing more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. David, I vetoed 750 bills. I had thousands of line item vetoes. I think it made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. Uh, I think it made a difference when it came to laws that, but for my signature, would have added time and money to our lives, but weren't going to make us any safer, weren't going to make us any more healthy. I stood up and said no. Um, I think the biggest, um, biggest indicator of how that went over was the fact that I did get reelected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time in a state that's two to one Democrat, being a penny pincher and being somebody who was standing up for uh, less government. Now, Governor, what are your thoughts on the two front running presidential candidates? Uh, Tweedledee, Tweedledum. Uh, elect either one of them, and I'm going to suggest we, we are going to have a heightened police state in this country, a growing police state, continued growing police state. Uh, elect either one, I'm going to suggest that we are still going to be in a state of perpetual war, that we're going to continue to militarily intervene in other countries' affairs that result, I think, in hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for our military interventions perhaps would otherwise not exist. And then lastly, uh, let's balance the federal budget now. Um, not 28 years from now, but now. Uh, if we don't balance the budget, I think we're going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse. A monetary collapse very simply being when the dollars that we have in our pocket don't buy a thing because of the accompanying inflation that is going to go along with this at some point. I also advocate abolishing the uh, income tax, corporate tax, eliminating the IRS, and replacing all of that with one federal consumption tax. I am advocating the fair tax. I think that's really the answer when it comes to American jobs, because in a zero corporate ta tax rate environment, if the private sector doesn't create tens of millions of jobs, I don't know what it takes to create tens of millions of jobs. So big difference between myself and the other two. Uh, and David, when I talk about myself and the other two, uh, I'm on the ballot currently in 47 states and the District of Columbia. We are litigated in the other three. Uh, we think we're going to prevail. So although there are other third party candidates, no other third party candidate will come close to 50 ballot access. Now, uh, you've recently filed a lawsuit against the Presidential Commission on Debates. They're a very secretive organization, and in my estimation, they're the new Federal Reserve because they're secretive like the Federal Reserve. Um, only a handful of uh, individuals represent these people, um, this organization. Um, they're not elected by the people, and they have great control over the people. They're called, again, the Presidential Commission on Debates. And you have filed a lawsuit against this secretive organization. Tell us about the lawsuit and why you decided to file it. Well, we will be filing a number of lawsuits, actually. We filed the first of what are going to be three, but uh, the first one was on uh, antitrust uh, grounds. Who are they and why are they able to uh, 
restrict who doesn't or does get into the debates. They are a private organization, and they're made up of Democrats and Republicans. So they have no vested interest whatsoever in seeing a third party on the debate stage. They were set up after Ross Perot, really, to prevent uh, a Ross Perot from ever being on stage again. Yeah, it, it's amazing. And um, I know you don't represent them, obviously, but what are the rules? What are they telling you? As far as you know, what what do you need to to be part of the well, debate? Well, you you have to have you have to be qualified in enough states uh, to uh, to have a potential of winning, uh, be be able to win enough electoral college votes to win, and then the other one is uh, a certain showing in the polls. Well, David, if you're not in the polls, how do you uh, how do you how do you get 15 percent in the polls if you're not in the polls? You know, right now, uh, arguably, I'm at six percent nationally. I would just ask you. Do you hear my name six times for every time you hear Obama or Romney's name 100 times? Uh, I'm going to suggest you hear my name one time for every 5,000 times you hear these guys' names. So I think we're, point is, I think we're doing a terrific job here. If it were just being reported a month ago, if it were just reported where I was, um, I think I would be at that 15% today because interest when it comes to my candidacy is a good thing. I really do have a resume to not only suggest that I can do this job, but that I could, that I could do a good job at it. Now, uh, when do you expect a ruling on this lawsuit? Uh, I think part of the lawsuit is, is uh, it has to be ruled on immediately because the first debate is October 3rd. Okay. And again, for viewers, they're called the Presidential Commission on Debates, a very, very secretive organization. I'm calling them the new Federal Reserve. So. Uh, Google them and learn a little bit more about them. Although they operate in secrecy, you're not going to learn much about them. Um, now, Governor, um, we're going to talk about issues in, in one more minute, but uh, very briefly, tell us a little bit about the 5% threshold you are trying to get in the general election and why hitting it would be benefic beneficial to your cause. Well, reaching 5% would entitle the Libertarian Party to, uh, to matching funds, significant matching funds, to where next presidential cycle, the Libertarian Party, because of those matching funds, uh, would be a real power to be reckoned with. Not that it won't be the case this go-round, but uh, given that amount of money reaching a 5% threshold, very, very significant. It would mean uh, there wouldn't be any issue with ballot access in all 50 states reaching a 5% threshold. Okay, and right now, how much does the Libertarian Party receive in federal funding? Uh, none. Uh, I did, uh, I did <coughs> um, uh, submit for federal matching funds. It really had to do more with uh, being in the Republican primary than in the general election, but uh, we may receive up to a million dollars in federal matching funds this go-round. And that would be based on uh, Bob Barr showing last election of one half of one percent. So you can see uh, how significant this could be if we got to five percent. Yeah, you're talking about millions of dollars more, tens of millions. Now let's talk a little bit about the issues, Governor. Uh, what are your thoughts on the president's controversial uh, NDAA bill? And what would you do about this bill if elected? Well, uh, if I would have been president, I would not have signed the National Defense Authorization Act allowing for you and I as U.S. citizens to be arrested and detained without being charged. I think this is why we fought wars. Okay, so you obviously would try to repeal it. Well, and it will come up for reauthorization. I don't know what the time frame is on reauthorization, re but I would not reauthorize uh, it given uh, that caveat to the National Defense Authorization Act. Now, are you highly offended by this bill? It seems that some people agree with it, disagree with it, but there's not an outrage over this, uh, over this bill. I mean, is this bill, uh, you know, something that the American public should be very concerned about? This is a bill that the American public should be concerned about. This and the Patriot Act, uh, the further, the constant furthering erosion of our civil liberties. And uh, this is happening in a very insidious way. The National Defense Authorization Act. Look, we fought wars over the government not being able to arrest you or I and hold us, uh, detain us without being charged. I think this is fundamental to the United States Constitution. I think it's fundamental to why we have fought wars. Okay. Now, what are your thoughts on the fact that the president has yet to shut down Guantanamo Bay? And uh, how would you address the issue of um, POW torture? Well, uh, the reasons for Guantanamo Bay, the reasons for shutting down what has become synonymous with Guantanamo Bay is torture 
and detainment without being charged. I would stop both of those practices immediately. Should we or do we need a facility like Guantanamo Bay? Perhaps. So perhaps we keep Guantanamo Bay open, but it would not be open for business to conduct torture or uh, detainment without charge. Okay. Uh, now, what are your thoughts on the Libyan uh, embassy killings and the continued unrest we see occurring in several Middle Eastern countries? Well, let's uh, vacate these embassies now. Uh, it would not be a show of weakness on our part to get out of these embassies, but let's get out of these embassies. Uh, what are these embassies for? We're setting ourselves up symbolically to be a target uh, in an area that's uh, very volatile. Uh, I think it's volatile because of our military interventions, and that doesn't seem to come to an end. But let's get out of the embassies. Uh, let's not put ourselves up as a target. Uh, we've uh, put ourselves in the position in the first place by intervening in all of, uh, in, militarily in all of these uh, different countries. Uh, Libya, look, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to uh, oust Muammar Gaddafi, and now the group that's coming in to uh, replace Muammar Gaddafi uh, arguably is made up of al-Qaeda. Um, gee, um, none of this... See None of this seems to make any sense, and yet this is uh, our continued state of war. Now, this issue has many people talking about foreign aid. Um, should we provide foreign aid to other countries? Uh, what is your uh, stance on foreign aid? Well, I think that uh, people need to understand that foreign aid is, is aid to foreign governments that we prop up. Uh, we oust one dictator and then we put a new dictator in power. Foreign aid is the, is the money that we give to the new dictator. It's not to people in these countries, it's to the dictators. It's taking from poor people in the United States and giving it to rich people in other countries that are taking over these other countries. So foreign aid should stop. Okay. Now, how would you handle the Iranian crisis? Obviously, you've got uh, Israel, the United States talking about... Uh, possibly attacking Iran. Um, how would you handle the Iranian crisis? Well, I would not bomb Iran. Uh, I don't think there is a military threat from uh, Iran. And uh, if we bomb Iran, in my opinion, we're going to find ourselves with another 100 million enemies to this country uh, that, uh, but for that bombing, would not, would not otherwise occur. Uh, let's not forget that after 9-11, the largest demonstration in the world in support of the United States was in Iran. Uh, and where and million a million supporters show up, a million demonstrators show up in support of the United States, and we're going to bomb the citizens of Iran. Look, our beef is with Ahmadinejad, but it shouldn't involve bombing. If I were president of the United States right now, I would urge Israel to not be bombing Iran. Uh, if we don't want them to get a nuclear weapon, um, let's uh, let's consider the notion of uh, free trade as opposed to uh, embargo. Okay. And uh, we, you talked a little bit about it earlier on uh, in the segment here. In your estimation, uh, what is the state of the U.S. economy? Uh, on the verge of collapse. Uh, the fact that we're borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend, I believe that it's not sustainable. Uh, the only way we have a chance at avoiding a monetary collapse, in my opinion, is to uh, balance the federal budget now. So I'm making a couple of promises. One is I will submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. I promise to veto any legislation where expenses exceed revenue. And David, I want to suggest that with those two promises kept, spending will be lower than any other scenario you could possibly come up with. Does that, does that get us uh, out from under the threat of a monetary collapse? No, because we still have a $16 trillion debt uh, we need strong U.S. dollar policies, not weak U.S. dollar policies, and we continue uh, on the pathway to weak dollar. Now, you talked about economic collapse. You're a governor. You've, you know, you've had to look at spreadsheets and budgets before. Uh, just looking at our finances, our country's finances, I know you're not, you know, no one's psychic, but where do you think, I mean, if you were to give a time frame as to uh, when this country might collapse economically, I mean, what time frame would you give? Well, I get the sense sooner than later, and um, I, I get the sense that uh, this is the, so the solution is to slash spending. The solution starts with a balanced budget, and that's where I'm going to start. Uh, sooner than later, uh, obviously, uh, thousands of people worldwide make their living uh, predicting uh, bond prices, and those bond prices um, don't reflect that at all today, but it will be a bond market collapse 
and it's not going to be anything that anybody sees. It's just going to happen. But any estimated time frame? I mean, I know, again, you're not a, no one is psychic, but you're a man, you know, you're a, you're a well, political I, figure. Well, I'm believing that it's sooner than later. and I'm Within believing, a year? Well, if I were in that, if I actually believed in that, I would, um, I, I would make bets to that from a financial standpoint. But uh, um, I do believe it's sooner than later. And regardless of when it comes, and I'll just say that it is coming, that it's looming, that we're we can't escape the mathematics of what we're currently doing, uh, that we should be on the safe side and embark on what the solutions are to go along with all this. And that starts with balancing revenues and expenditures. Now, in my estimation, uh, the main culprit for this economic collapse, this is just my assessment, is uh, the Federal Reserve. Um, what are your thoughts on the Federal Reserve, and do you support abolishing it, auditing it? Uh, I, would, I would sign legislation abolishing the Federal Reserve. Uh, I think it's an inside game. The Federal Reserve uh, takes money from Treasury. Uh, uh, they loan it to the banks. Uh, they take money from the Treasury. Treasury prints the money. Federal Reserve gives it to the banks at 0% interest. Banks don't loan that money out to you or I. They buy up Treasuries in a closed loop. Uh, look at it. This is Bernie Madoff with a printing machine. How long would Bernie have lasted? Well. How long are we going to last? Because we do have a printing machine. Uh, I would abolish the Federal Reserve if given the opportunity. I would repeal legal tender laws if given the opportunity. Uh, I would establish competing currencies if given the opportunity. Okay. Now, uh, how would you handle the uh, Medicare and Social Security dilemma? Well, Social Security is absolutely fixable. It's, uh, Social Security is a system that just needs to take in more money than what it pays out. I am advocating the fair tax. so. With the fair tax implemented, there would no longer be a deduction from your payroll check for Social Security. Social Security, Medicare, unemployment would come out of the proceeds of the fair tax. The employer match for all of those three would come out of the proceeds of the fair tax. But Social Security, absolutely savable. Uh, a few caveats, raising the retirement age, uh, changing the escalator built into Social Security from the wage index to the inflation rate. I think you could have a very fair means testing when it comes to Social Security. How much did you pay in? How much should you get paid out given a certain level of income? Um, and then have to have an opt-in, opt-out provision. But Social Security is a problem that is just pale in comparison to Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, Open-ended open -ended entitlements. Uh, I. As governor of New Mexico, uh, I oversaw the reform of Medicaid, which was health care to the poor in New Mexico. Uh, we took it from a fee-for-service model to a managed care model. Uh, we saved hundreds of millions of dollars, and we set up better health care networks uh, doing that. If the federal government would have block granted the state of New Mexico 43 percent less money, done away with all the strings and all the mandates, David, I think I could have effectively overseen the delivery of health care to the poor. I would apply that same model uh, to health care for those over 65, Medicare. Uh, federal government needs to get out of the health care business completely, devolve it to the states. States are going to end up drawing new lines with regard to eligibility. Uh, but what we need to recognize is uh, if we don't spend within our means, uh, there won't be health care for anybody. Uh, in a monetary collapse, the government uh, will be incapable of delivering any goods and services. And just rewinding, you said uh, obviously Social Security is not this country's biggest problem, but you did mention raising the age. What would you raise it to? Uh, to make it actuarially sound, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting the following, but uh, currently we have 62 and 65, uh, 70, 72. Okay. All right. And um, now let's talk a little bit about the immigration issue. Recently, uh, Mitt Romney and President Barack Obama were conducting interviews, I believe it was with Univision, a Hispanic media outlet. How would you handle the illegal uh, immigration issue? Well, uh, I would start with the premise that, uh, that immigration is a good thing uh, and that um, it's a good thing. I think that we should make it as easy as possible for someone that wants to come into this country and work uh, to get a work visa. I'm not talking about a green card, I'm not talking about citizenship, but a work visa. A work visa would entail a background check and a social security card so that applicable taxes would get paid. If we implement the fair tax, taxes won't be an issue at all because whether you're illegal, legal, a visitor to the U.S. or a U.S. citizen, nobody is going to be able to avoid paying one federal consumption tax. 
Let's not build a fence. Uh, let's recognize that border violence is a prohibition phenomenon. Legalized marijuana, arguably 75% of the border violence with Mexico goes away. And with regard to the 11 million illegal immigrants that are here in this country right now, we need to set up a grace period where we can document those 11 million illegal immigrants uh, so that we do have tax-paying, law-abiding citizens, and we don't want criminals working in this country. What about those that saying, well, because they, were, uh, they came in here illegally, they've cost us a lot of money in the ER room, education. I mean, would you find them at all just so that they can offset some of the cost that they have cost this country? Well, I think, uh, I think that that's a misconception that they've cost this country um, money. Uh, as governor of New Mexico, I asked everyone in my administration uh, and that would have been those in law enforcement, uh, those in education, those in health and human services, to give me a cost-benefit analysis. Legal, illegal. Uh, how much money is coming in the door? How much is going out? Uh, the 100 percent consensus was more money was coming in the door than is going out. Uh, what we little realize is that for the most part, uh, illegal immigrants are providing false documentation that result in taxes being out of, taken out of checks with uh, no claim made on those taxes ever. Okay, so you're saying the illegal immigrants do not cost this country money? Uh, the illegal immigrants do not cost this country money, and from the context of uh, uh, adding or taking jobs that U.S. citizens don't want, uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, they are value-added. Now, there's there's no excuse for illegal immigration, but I'm going to suggest to you that the reason we have so much illegal immigration is because you can't get a work visa and come into this country and work. Would immigrants stand in line if the line was moving to get a work visa? I believe they would stand in line if the line was moving. Okay. Let's change gears a little bit. Uh, recently, uh, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder was exonerated um, from any wrongdoing in relation to the Fast and Furious operation. Um, what are your thoughts on that operation? Well, just that uh, my experience uh, growing a company from one person to a thousand people, my experience as governor of New Mexico, I just find it, um, I find it almost beyond belief that as the head of an agency, you would not understand what is going on within the agency. That said, if he doesn't know, that's even a bigger indictment, I think. Okay. And uh, what do you think about the operation itself? I mean, the fact that that operation was carried out. Well, it seems uh, an extension of everything that we seem to do when it comes to the government, uh, and that uh, is that it just all defies logic. Uh, I would suggest that fast and furious is our foreign policy when it comes to military intervention, and uh, let's shoot first, ask questions later, and uh, deal with uh, all the enemies that uh, we have created worldwide as a result of that aggression. Okay. Now, speaking of shooting, let's talk a little bit about uh, gun control and gun control laws. Obviously, you know that uh, after the Colorado shootings, many politicians were saying, once again, we need stricter gun control laws. You, you hear that quite often. Uh, where do you stand on gun control? Well, I don't think the Second Amendment could be any more clear. Uh, I am not for restricting handguns or guns of any kind, whether that be caliber rounds in the uh, chamber. I just think when you make guns illegal, uh, those that end up owning those guns are criminals. Okay. Now, um, also, you, you touched earlier on uh, the war on drugs a little bit when we were talking about the border, uh, border violence. It seems that Colorado and Washington, I believe it's Washington, have a referendum that's going to be taking place in November where they're going to try to legalize marijuana altogether. You're not going to need a medical note or anything like that. You'll just be able to take it. Oh. Where do you stand? Just elaborate. Where do you stand on the war on drugs? Well, I think that we should legalize marijuana now, control it, regulate it, tax it. I think we are at a tipping point. Uh, I think Colorado is going to be that tipping point. It's on the ballot this fall. Regulate marijuana like alcohol. Terrific name for the referendum speaks for itself. Citizens of Denver six years ago voted to decriminalize marijuana on a campaign based on marijuana being safer than alcohol. Uh, I think when, when we legalize marijuana, and I say when because 50% of Americans now support the notion, why is the number so high? It's because people are talking about it. I think that people recognize that there's a direct correlation between the prohibition of marijuana and the prohibition of alcohol. Uh, I think that once we legalize marijuana in this country, one, once one state legalizes marijuana in this country, the other 49 
will fall in line. It'll be the first of 50 dominoes. How will that work when it comes to Colorado? Well, when everybody in Austin, Texas wants to get on an airplane to go to Denver for the weekend to chill out, um, I think the other states will understand that uh, this is policy that should affect their states uh, as well as Colorado. Once we legalize marijuana, I think we take giant steps toward rational drug policy with regard to all the other drugs. And rational drug policy would start with looking at drugs as a health issue uh, rather than a criminal justice issue. I'm just playing devil's advocate. What about those that say, uh, well, it sends the wrong message? It said, you know, and the kids, you know, a parent can obviously be high on drugs. And, you know, well, you, I, I, I uh, could not more, uh, I, I couldn't uh, disagree more adamantly. Uh, kids doing drugs, uh, is that a situation that you as a family member want to deal with? Or is that a situation that you want to involve the government and the criminal justice system? Uh, I love my kids. Um, I want to keep my kids well informed. I don't want my kids subject to the criminal justice system where they may be excluded from the opportunities that this country does avail ourselves of. We uh, may have 20 million convicted felons in this country on drug-related crime, uh, but for those, but for uh, drug felony crime, um, they would otherwise be arguably tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. Okay. Now, um, just changing gears a little bit, uh, what are your thoughts on the various internet regulation bills that continue to be drafted in Congress? CISPA, uh, I forgot all the other acronyms, but what, what are your, what's your take on all these bills? Well, uh, what's, what's, um, what's the prospect of Gary Johnson being president of the United States with a record as governor of New Mexico having vetoed as many bills as I vetoed? Count on me vetoing all this kind of legislation that wants... Uh, that uh, government wants to get in and fix the internet. There's nothing that I want the government to fix or protect me from when it comes to the internet. Okay. Now, I'm a libertarian, you're a libertarian, and we actually have a uh, difference of opinion, and that's on the issue of gay marriage. Um, let me know where you stand on this. You, you do support gay marriage. I do. I think uh, marriage equality is a constitutionally guaranteed right uh, on par with civil rights of the 60s. Right. Now, but under civil unions, I mean, isn't that forcefully, ta isn't that a violation of the separation of church and state? You're uh, forcefully taking a word marriage, which was created by the religious community. And uh, I view it as a constitutionalist libertarian as a violation of the separation of church and state. Well, I would take the opposite view that uh, fundamental to uh, president of the United States, fundamental to governing as president of the United States would be uh, governing under strict adherence to the U.S. Constitution. I think this is a federal issue because of the constitutional questions that it raises, which, like I say, I think are on par with civil rights of the 60s. But don't they get all rights uh, necessary? Don't gay couples get all the rights that a straight couple gets under civil unions? Uh, well, if you, if you take the stance uh, that the government should get out of the marriage business and be in the civil union business, effectively what you're saying is you're not going to affect this issue at all because... 41 states uh, recognize marriages between a man and a woman. There are thousands of lines of federal law that contain the word marriage. Uh, if you enact legislation to get the government out of the marriage business and into the civil union business, effectively, you're going to have to change thousands of lines of federal law to make this stick. By acknowledging uh, marriage equality, no line of federal law has to be changed. And uh, getting back to the fair tax, uh, arguably enacting the fair tax does away with about half the issues surrounding marriage equality, with ha which have to do with uh, uh, rights of uh, inheritance upon death. Okay. So you're mm. being more pragmatic when you uh, support gay marriage in that saying that you'd well, have to... Well, it, it is pragmatic, but I'm going to also maintain that it is constitutional. To take that word, to forcefully take that word from the religious community. Well, the notion that, uh, that we are all guaranteed uh, equal and inalienable rights. Okay. Well, that's a difference of agreements that many uh, constitutionalists and libertarians have. Um, I do think it violates the separation of church and state, although I do support civil unions, however somebody might feel about that lifestyle. But I'm not running for president, so it doesn't really matter. Um, on to another question here. Um, I've read reports that your campaign is in financial trouble. Um, is, is that, in fact, true? No, it's not true at all. 
Oh, it's not true at all? Not at all. It was a report that I said it was uh, about $300,000 in debt or something? Well, one of the things about racking up debt, if you will, is, is that uh, we do have debt coming into the campaign. Debt is actually... Uh, uh, debt can actually be garnered uh, through matching funds after the campaign's over with. So uh, we're counting on matching funds actually to make up the difference there. What has been your experience uh, like on the campaign trail? I mean, just as a, as a candidate running for office. What well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this if there weren't a lot of excitement that's being generated. I wouldn't be doing this if uh, either party were actually talking about significant change. Neither are. And so... Um, I really thought running as a Republican in the Republican primary, it was going to hard to be mar hard to marginalize two people talking about the same message on stage. That would have been myself and Ron Paul. Uh, I didn't find myself marginalized. I just found myself kicked out of the process. And I thought what I rec or thought what I've witnessed is Ron Paul continuing to be marginalized. I did not think he was going to win the Republican nomination. So back in December, where does the voice go for this movement? Uh, after Ron Paul leaves this movement, well, I think it, it was going. I thought it was going to fall uh, on the uh, Libertarian nominee for president. I saw an opportunity to be that nominee, and here I am. And what do you say to uh, Ron Paul supporters who, for whatever reason, are hesitant to vote for you? Well, uh, that um, Ron Paul and I are saying the same things, and if you're hesitant to vote for me, um, I would ask you, what is Ron? Uh, what is uh, Mitt Romney saying that? Is anything like um, liberty and freedom? And what is Barack Obama saying that in any way resembles uh, liberty and freedom? Now, Governor, what do you say to listeners who say uh, and viewers who say voting for you would be throwing their vote away? Well, that if everybody were to throw their vote away, um, I would be the next president of the United States. Uh, I would argue that throwing your vote away is voting for somebody that you don't believe in and that uh, if you want to change the system, you vote for the person that you, th that you most uh, agree with. You know, it's, it's one thing also to just agree with what it is a person is saying. You know what? They've got to have a resume to go along with what's coming out of their mouth to suggest that they would actually doggedly pursue what it is they're talking about. David, there is nothing in my resume to suggest that I'm not going to doggedly pursue everything it is that I'm talking about. Okay. Now, quite often in the liberty movement, people get frustrated, they get saddened, because it just seems like we're not making too much headway. Um, you know, what advancement has the liberty movement made, in your estimation? Well, um, I think it is front and center. Uh, I think that this is a pivotal election for the liberty and freedom movement. Um, voting for the lesser of two evils, uh, I'm going to argue, is going to change nothing. Vote your conscience. This cycle, potentially, it has... Uh, the chance to change this uh, forever going forward. But on the campaign trail, do you notice anything? I mean, what advancements have you seen? I mean, what headway has the movement made? Anything tangible? Something that the public, uh, that viewers could be proud of? Well, the best a libertarian candidate has ever done running for president of the United States is right at 1% of the general election vote. Uh, right now, I'm polling at 6%. Um, does that change between now and election day? I think it changes significantly if I can actually uh, uh, if I can actually get more attention, and I think I'm going to get more attention. That's the way I feel. The way this is all playing out, and more attention for me equates to oh, um, entrepreneur, um, two-term governor of New Mexico. All these crazy things that libertarians talk about. Arguably, this guy was the libertarian governor of New Mexico for eight years. How did it work out? Uh, in a state that was two to one Democrats, uh, I got elected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time. Okay. Well, I'll give you one last opportunity to uh, speak to members of the public. Is there any one message you would like to uh, send to viewers here who are watching on PrisonPlanet.tv or to listeners on the radio show? If you want to stop the heightened police state that exists in this country, vote for me. If you want to stop the continued military interventions that we that perpetuate themselves in this country, vote for me. If you actually want jobs addressed, if you actually want spending addressed, if you actually want this country to survive, vote for me. I'm promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013. I'm promising to advocate on the part of eliminating income tax, corporate tax, and abolishing the IRS. 
Well, Governor, thank you so much. David, for, thank you so much for coming. Best of luck on the campaign trail, and um, on behalf of all patriots, thank you for fighting for political freedom. We really appreciate well, it. That's a two-way street. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all for InfoWars Nightly News. We again want to thank Governor Johnson for making himself available and allowing us to interview him. And if you want to continue supporting this operation, this patriot-loving, freedom-loving operation, become a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. It costs less than $6 a month, and actually one membership is good for, I believe, six people in total. So you can split that cost with other people. So there you go. Great programming on PrisonPlanet.tv. You can watch Alex's show live, get access to his documentaries, and it once again helps fund our operation. Thank you once again for watching InfoWars Nightly News. Please join us again tomorrow. Until then, have a wonderful evening.